on that? Thank you all for being here. Um, as you all know, the Department of Justice recently closed its case um, into the actions of the Chattanooga police officers on July 16th. And a short time after that, I concluded my administrative inquiry into this case. The officers involved in the fateful events of that day, some of whom are standing behind me, clearly placed themselves at grave physical risk to protect our community. Today is an important part of the journey they started on July 16th on that tragic morning here in Chattanooga. They have chosen to be here um, to continue along that journey. They are very specific about the means in which they want to tell their story and we're glad to be here to tell a part of it. Um, I appreciate very much y'all's respect and y'all's compassion about how difficult that is for them and how important it is to respect their rights, their needs, and their own personal safety. Note two things. The men standing behind me and beside me are absolutely heroes in every sense of that word. They're heroes because they chose to place themselves, their bodies, their future selves at risk to protect people who were endangered by criminals and terrorists who wanted to harm our community. But know something else equally as much. As, as true as they are heroes, they also hate hearing that word applied to them. They hate hearing that word because they know that they were a half a dozen of literally hundreds of first responders from a variety of agencies and across the Chattanooga Police Department who did and who would do exactly what they did that day. They know that every day officers at our department, in our community, and across the country face similar risks when they go to a dark door in the middle of the night or to a car on the side of the road. I know on at least several other occasions this year People have tried to kill my police officers with gunfire. This happens every day. So know this. They are heroes. They are my heroes. That's the last thing they like to be hear themselves called. They are going to be available to talk to a reporter after this. Um, in the meantime, they have asked that Sean O'Brien, standing to my left, who is a senior police officer, a master patrol officer at the Chattanooga Police Department, um, to say some words on their behalf and for all of them. So with no further ado, um, Sean. Thank you, Chief. It's uh, with a profound sense of regret and sadness that we stand before you today. For us, July 16th will always be about Gunnery Sergeant Thomas Sullivan, Staff Sergeant David Wyatt, Sergeant Carson Holmquist, Lance Corporal Squire Wells and Petty Officer Randall Smith. It will be about their courage that day and their service to the United States of America. We can now sadly publicly extend our deepest sympathies to their loved ones, their families, their friends, and their co workers. We are truly sorry for your loss, and you'll be in our thoughts and prayers always. We also want to acknowledge our fellow officers of the Chattanooga Police Department, who should all be standing before you today. These officers put themselves between evil and innocence on a daily basis. They run towards things that others run away from and they do it time and again to keep our community safe. We are humbled by their service every day. We also want to acknowledge the service and the valor of our counterparts in law enforcement agencies across Hamilton County, 
the state of Tennessee, and within our federal partner agencies. Their actions, along with our brothers and sisters in the fire and medical services, in the hours and days after the tragic events of July 16th, bring us confidence that public servants across this great country stand at the ready. We only need to look to Oregon, Colorado, and California for that affirmation. Lastly, we want to thank our loved ones, friends, and co-workers for their continued support. It is with their sustenance that we humbly suit up every day and serve the city of Chattanooga. Obviously, this is very difficult for all of us. Again, I just want to repeat my appreciation to you all for respecting these officers' um, needs and privacy as much as possible. The reality is they're here largely because this information is public, but it's also an important part of their process of moving forward. So um, we are going to retire here without questions, and they're going to speak to a single reporter. And again, I appreciate you all understanding how important their privacy and their sense of safety is um, in the days, weeks, and months that follow today. Thank you very much. made a very deliberate decision. They did not want to do any on-camera interviews and they wanted to speak with one outlet and that choice was made by them and them solely. So we can we interview the reporter when she's done with them so we can... She's behind me. So. Oh. Uh. Huh? Um, How do so we know what they say if you can't tell us what you asked them? That's all the point of them having the exclusive I mean, with... Yeah. You read the paper yeah. So the chief and Officer O'Brien are going to come back and answer questions for you guys directly on camera, but the other four officers are not going to be joining in on that. Okay. So that well, shouldn't give you guys availability for sound. Huh? Officer O'Brien will come back here. That is true. Okay. That is true. That's good. Yes. Everybody's good. <laughs> As you can see from him talking a little bit, that's it's not an easy thing to talk about. Um, so they. Uh, they really, really were not interested in doing anything on camera directly. Can you tell us who they are from the after hours? Yes, can you show me a picture? No, I definitely can. You've got an assistant chief on each side. So, I saw it pop up on the screen, that's why I was like, okay, we're going to go ahead and go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Does everybody have the names that he's going over? Um, of course, the two people on the end, that African-American male was Assistant Chief Tracy Arnold. Oh, on the, was he on this side? Caucasian male was Assistant Chief Eric Tucker. Both traditional spellings. Tracy with a Y. Uh, are they the only five that, that fired their weapons? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that is correct. Who was the Assistant Chief on the other side? 
Caucasian or African American? African American Tracy Arnold with a Y. Uh, look on the list of names. I can't remember his name. Please don't write cornbread. So after Pettigo is, is going to be Tracy Arnold? I thought yeah. that was on the list. No, he's on the far end. Jeff Lancaster. Jeff Lan Officer Jeff Lancaster. Okay. That's the one they call cornbread? Yeah, that is correct. Is it Lan or Lang? Lan. Lan. Lancaster. All officers. Yes, all officers. Uh, then officer. Uh, and yes, all five did discharge their firearm, and they are the only five who discharged their firearm. They were, uh, if not one, the, that group, but the first people to actually be on scene. Are they the only five that fired their weapons? Uh, yes. Maybe two questions each. Is that cool for everybody? Does that give you enough? Yeah. Um, I mean, we'll play nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everybody gets two. We get shit covered. That should cover it if everybody. And we'll yeah. start down. Do you just want to go? We'll start with you, and then let you guys cover up where she where she may have left off. Okay. Sound good? Do you guys want to do this at the podium, or you want to do straight up here? Podium. 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 podium with the mics. Okay. Is everyone ready? Yep. Yep. Okay. Who started? Me? Yep. Oh. Uh, Chief Fletcher, are you at all concerned about the safety of these five officers now that their names have been released to the public? Absolutely. Um, I'm concerned for all of my officers every day. We live in a society that's gotten way too violent, 
from both criminals and terrorists, and these officers place themselves between that violence, that evil, every single day. Um, that was why I made the comments to you earlier that I respect, I appreciate y'all's respect to their needs. The reality is their names and their faces are public images, and um, you all would have access to that regardless. But we have no reason to believe that the, the criminals involved in this incident pose a direct threat to them, but we are working with our partners, state, local, and federal, to review that every single day. There is nothing as important as the safety of officers like Sean O'Brien and his partners across the city. Have you done anything specific as far as security around these officers' homes to amp up security around their homes to make sure they're safe while they are not on the job? Yes. You don't really expect me to tell you what it is, do you? <laughs> no, we, we meet with them and their chains of command and my executive and my command staff regularly to make sure that whatever they need, just like the rest of our community, they receive. If somebody is at risk, we are committed to doing everything we can to keep them safe, especially the officers who put themselves between violence and the community every day. And we've worked with them since this happened and afterwards, and we do that in every critical incident. We, are, we have police officers out there dealing with very, very violent people, terrorism or otherwise, on a daily basis. And that is one of the sacrifices police officers make, both to their risk, their physical risk, but also to their emotional and the well-being risk of their entire family. And we remain committed and we're creating new processes and procedures to make sure we support officers both physically and um, emotionally in the aftermath of these types of incidents. Um, can you elaborate on the autopsy results of, of the disease? Or I cannot. How many times were, uh, I guess, how many rounds were fired and how many times was he shot? Enough to end the threat. Okay. I'm not trying to be coy. Yeah. That's part of the ongoing investigation being conducted by the DOJ and the FBI. Um, what's important to know is that officers of the Chattanooga Police Department faced that threat and used the force necessary to make sure that that criminal terrorist did not harm anybody else. They used the reasonable amount of, of force to make sure that that threat did not endanger anybody else's life. I know you mentioned that this is something you've seen before in the department where officers putting their lives at risk and having to fire their weapon. Have you noticed with these officers in particular who fired their gun on July 16th, has, have you noticed a change in their, I guess, responding, their, how they're recovering from it? I know it's a very emotional time still today. Have you noticed anything in these officers since then? That's a very good question and I, and I, I very much appreciate you caring about their well-being. You cannot go through something like this as a police officer, as a community member, as somebody who supports either one of them without changing. Uh, our commitment is to make sure that the people that we ask to face harm and violence and evil um, receive all the support that they need in every way possible to return to their family as the same healthy, whole person they were when they came to work for us. And we have expended every single energy we can to make sure they get that. What I can tell you is a few weeks ago, we had a call at the very same location of shots fired, and many of those same officers, including Officer O'Brien, and I rushed back out that to the scene, and this tragic and critical incident did not in any way dampen our officers' uh, enthusiasm for protecting you, our community, and our families from harm in every form. I know that you said that there, some of this, of course, is still confidential for a while. Can Officer O'Brien give us a narrative of what they saw when they arrived at the scene, give us some idea of the way this all developed? He can to the extent that he's comfortable with it, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm on our canine unit, so I, I'm monitoring all, all our dispatch channels uh, for the city police. So I was able to hear the initial dispatch call over to Lee Highway, and the sergeant got there extremely quickly and gave out a fantastic Bolo, be on the lookout for, uh, description of the suspect and vehicle. Um, I happen to be sitting right here in the back lot in my car doing a report when uh, that Bolo came out. So I pulled out of the service center and started heading toward 153 because that was our last known location. He was heading north on 153. Uh, by the time I got to the Coca-Cola plant, <clears throat> I encountered the suspect. He was coming toward downtown at a high rate of speed. And uh, we had a brief, if you will, I'll call it a pursuit, but 
I swung around on him, he swung around because he had passed up his turn into the river park. He then got in on the river park road, gunned it. Uh, he was driving a Mustang and uh, crashed through the gate. And uh, at that point, I mean, it was pretty clear what his intent was. So at that point, the training kicked in from there. I notified dispatch what we had. And uh, w within just a moment or two, we had officers there. And we proceeded toward the gunfire and, um, and mitigated the threat. What was he doing the first time you saw him after he got out of the car? Uh, he, he rapidly exit, exited the car after he crashed the gate, and because of uh, my point of view, he, he was out of my sight almost instantaneously because there's trees and stuff in the way, and he had began firing into the building. Um, Let me squeeze one more question in. Did he fire first at you, or did you all fire first at him? I'll be honest with you. Um, never having been in combat before, and God bless our soldiers across this country. Uh, they'd be ever better able to answer something like that. The gunfire started right away. There was times when it was coming at us and when it was going away from us, uh, but when he fired at us, exactly, I don't know. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> okay, as long as it was let's, on, uh, on a let's roll. Let's let Chloe get a couple yeah. of questions in if she's got some. Um, how long have you been with the Chattanooga Police Department, and what made you want to go into this line of work? Uh, I've been with Chattanooga for eight and a half years. So I've, uh, 15, 15 years of law enforcement service. Um, and what was the other half? What, what made you want to go into this line of work knowing you kind of put yourself, you know, in the oh, that's, that's a fair question. Um, you know, when you're a rookie, you always say, well, to protect and serve. The reality is, the way I look at it, I have family that lives here in Chattanooga. Um, and I'm not going to rely on somebody else to provide protection to my family and my friends if I'm not willing to do it myself. Uh, and it's about public service. And I, I tell you, very few people embody that more than Officer O'Brien does. He, he's being humble. He was a state police officer in another state <coughs> before this, and he has made the choice twice to serve his community in two different communities. And um, we, not we the Chattanooga Police Department, we the community are lucky to have his service and the service of many others like him. Before we get away, that, that narrative again that you were on telling us earlier, uh, after the shooting between the officers and uh, 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 Abdulaziz, uh, where was he when he went down? He was in the motor pool yard, uh, closest to the fence line, nearest the uh, back of the building, is where he finally went down. So he's probably within maybe 10 yards of, of uh, officers that point you pretty mentioned close. pretty close I'm sorry yeah. you mentioned this was the first scenario with you in combat was this the first time you discharged your weapon no. was still today I know everyone gets emotional with it mm -hmm. was has this one been harder to overcome than any of your previous for, I mean for me personally I, I can't necessarily speak to any of the other officers that were involved it, it it's different um, it was very clear very early on what this was, um, that this was an attack on our country. Um, and, uh, but your training kicks in, you know? And so you, you're not, you know, you're blocking out a lot of stuff and it's, it's afterwards. But I will tell you this, <clears throat> you know, it's been 20 years since I had a previous shooting. The amount of support and uh, access to uh, help, if you will, for law enforcement uh, has changed dramatically. Uh, and I would thank the chief and his staff for all the support that they've given us and just processing through this stuff. But the best thing I've found ultimately is to talk to other cops that have been through similar experiences. That's the best way to process it. So. Yeah, Chief, at one point you said it was still um, an ongoing investigation. Can you elaborate about what makes it still ongoing and what still has to be done? Uh, that would be a question better referred to our partners at the FBI and the DOJ, but there are a number of leads that are still being pursued to make sure that this community, these officers, and other communities are safe. Um, it's, it's a symbol of the really robust partnership that we share with our federal partners that they are not going to leave any stone unturned until we are absolutely certain that there are no other threats to this community or ones like us. Have you been given a date on perhaps when it might be wrapped up? Yes, perhaps never. Uh, and I don't mean that flippantly. 
Um, it, it's, I talk to our partners routinely, uh, both here in Knoxville and um, nationally, and they are not going to let this go until they make sure that everybody and every lead and every potential risk is chased down. And the more you chase down leads, the more they pop up. So they're, you should be proud of the, the investigative response you've received from your law enforcement partnership in this case. Mr. Roy, right. and one other thing, I'm sorry, so, Officer Pettigo was hit. Someone went in and pulled Officer Pettigo out of the scene. Can you tell us about that? Uh, there was two of us that, uh, that helped get Officer Pettigo to cover. And then from there, there were several other officers that helped to get him out to an ambulance on, on the Amnicola Highway. Uh, and a lot of this occurred under fire. Under fire. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll end with this, which is that's one of the reasons why the, the officers are not comfortable talking, um, and it's such a sacrifice for Officer O'Brien to talk on their behalf, is for every person who stood up here behind me and every one of the Officer O'Briens who's talking, there were dozens of other people who faced or were willing to face those risks. And one of the ones that Officer O'Brien is referring to is a woman who works for me, and she helped drag Officer Pettigo out, um, and bullets were literally zipping past hers and other officers' heads and hitting the ground while she was defenseless to pull Officer Pettigo, who's probably twice her size, out of harm's way. Um, and, pe and officers do that every single night, every single day. And that's why it's very, very uncomfortable for these guys to come up here and take this credit. So I very much appreciate your respect and your, um, and your, and your um, accommodation. Was that woman a commissioned Thanks, officer? Thanks, y'all. It was one of my detectives. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Is it true all those other officers are just going to only be able to speak to the Times Free Press? Um, they, I'll, I'll talk to you off the record if you want. Yes, they chose, they wanted to tell their story one time. And it's kind of really their decision on who they wanted to talk to, and they came together as a group, and they chose one person. And I, I, as much as they like um, Shelly and respect her, I think I would, I would, if I were going to infer anything from it, it's that they're more comfortable talking to a print reporter than having their face and, and image all over the media. So please don't take it personally. They want to tell their story one time. They want to tell it together as a, as a group. And they really didn't want to have their face and their images for the reasons I set up there out any more than that. 